let's look at this poem. I want to spend the majority of the class on this poem because this is a terrific poem. And it's doing something of the same sort of thing. As uh, we've seen already he did with Tintern Abbey. Which is he wants to give an account of what Blake called innocence and experience. Those two contrary states of the human soul without referencing Blake, but they have the same mindset. They have the same view of human nature being fundamentally good. We're born good. We're in our essence good. And it, if he wants to account for something that we call bad or associate with bad, how does that arise then? If he's not going to appeal to the biblical account of the fall of Satan and the guise of a serpent deceiving Eve and Eve committing original, even Adam committing original sin and bringing about the fall of humanity who then inherit original sin such that we are no longer fundamentally good, but rather have our backs turned to God. We are rebels. And where there's no one righteous, not even one, which is what scripture says, we're conceived in sin and we are sinful from the day that we're born. It doesn't happen to us. We are born that way. We can be made more corrupt for sure, but there, we're not born in primal goodness. But, but Rousseau said we were. That's his own natural self. It was good. And then society oppressed him. Wordsworth agrees. So does Blake. So do the romantics in general. So does our culture. Which is why they're going to defend whatever identity you want to name for yourself. They're going to want to defend that because it comes from within you. It's going to be against society, but it's the true you. This is a romantic sensibility. Motivated by panentheism. The vision of that. It's, a, it's an impersonal, anti-personal vision. So how does he come about this? The first four stanzas I'm going to look at. He writes, just to give you a little bit of the history of the poem, he writes these first and then the poem sits there for a little while and then he adds to it later on. And you can, you'll see that there's a sort of a sharp um, breach of theme even between the first four and the latter stanzas. But he presents it in terms of something like a platonic vision of the good. Remember Plato and the allegory of the cave, the ideal forms. He makes the ideal forms connected to our childhood. Our childhood is presented as having all of the good, the true and the beautiful there. Everything the childhood sees is good. And then the fall happens. I'll read it first and then we'll, we'll go through it a little bit more closely. But again, it's called the Ode Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood. Note the latter uh, few words, from recollections. It's the imaginative recovery of the childhood, which is going to be the means of immortality. Remember, there's no talk of sin here, by the way. It's mortality. Mortality is death. In Christian theology, death comes as a result of sin. Wordsworth will also talk about that, but he will lean in the direction of mortality being the problem. And thus, uh, humanity with a panentheist vision will want to be immortal. Modern transhumanist science wants to make everybody live forever. You know, puff your face up with Botox, you know, and, and undergo all sorts of uh, uh, dietary regimes and physical health things and you can live who knows how long. You can even have blood transfused into you from younger people. If, you, if you're rich enough, you can, you can hold off aging. We want to live forever. As if the problem of life were death and not sin which leads to death. Right? But it, motivated by panentheism, it's death that's the problem because it's it's um, a problem with their idea of in, that we are inf infinite. Finitude becomes the main problem, not, not sin. Here's how he presents it. There was a time 
when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem appareled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of yore, turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen, I now can see no more. The rainbow comes and goes, and lovely is the rose. The moon doth with delight look round her when the heavens are bare. Waters on a starry night are beautiful and fair. The sunshine is a glorious birth. But yet I know where'er I go that there hath passed away a glory from the earth. Now, while the birds thus sing a joyous song, and while the young lambs bound as to the tabers sound, to me alone there came a thought of grief. A timely utterance gave that thought relief, and I again am strong. The cataracts blow their trumpets from the street, steep, no more shall grief of mine the season wrong. I hear the echoes through the mountains throng. The winds come to me from the fields of sleep, and all the earth is gay. Lin, land and sea give themselves up to jollity, and with the heart of May doth every beast keep holiday. Thou child of joy, shout round me, let me hear thy shouts, thou happy shepherd boy. Ye blessed creatures, I have heard the call ye to each other make. I see the heavens laugh with you in your jubilee. My heart is at your festival, my head hath its coronal. The fullness of your bliss I feel. I feel it all. O oh, evil day, if I were sullen while earth herself is adorning this sweet May morning, and the children are culling on every side, in a thousand valleys far and wide, fresh flowers. While the sun shines warm and the babe leaps up on his mother's arm, I hear, I hear with joy, I hear. But there's a tree of many one, a single field which I have looked upon, both of them speak of something that is gone. The pansy at my feet doth the same tale repeat. Whither is fled the visionary gleam? Where is it now the glory and the dream? So that's the end of the first part. And then he'll explain how it came about. But here he's just talking about something. What, if you had to summarize those four lines, what it, or four stanzas, what is he saying? If you had to summarize. What's he describing? He says it explicitly at various points, but. <coughs> Yep. Yes. Children, joy, the beauty of creation, the union of all those things, undarkened by anything else. It's, a, it's utopian. It's idyllic. It speaks to something of human experience as well, I think, which is why people gravitate towards it. Um, it's not universally true, but many people have very happy memories of childhood. Uh, or they remember the happy things. It might not be a long time, but a situation which, in which the sun was shining, in which uh, life seemed joyous, and no problems, no darkness. Wordsworth is remembering that time, and for him, maybe it was the majority of his time. Actually, if you read his work, it, he was not untouched by tragedy. He lost his parents very young. Recounts those terrible moments when he hears that his father's dead, hauled home from school, ten. These are moments in his life that he thinks are also, they change him. Um, 
But here he's not talking about the darkness of things. He's talking about just the light, the warmth, etc. And those are the things that he holds on and remembers. And yet, that is no longer the way he sees the world. That's what he's talking about. He no longer sees it wholly in terms of good. It's shifted. He now sees the loss of what he says at the end, the visionary gleam, the glory and the dream. It's gone. So now maybe he sees no good. It's only dark. He's bitter, perhaps. He's certainly been touched by a sense of despair. That's the problem that he identifies. So in line 58, where is it now, the glory and the dream? That's the question that he asks. He then answers the question. How did, we, how did it come to this? Where it began so good and it now is at the state where the glory and the dream are gone. Where did it go? How did it happen? Now he comes with a doctrine which Plato posits as a, an explanation for why human nature is as it is. He calls it the doctrine of anamnesis which is remembering, recollecting. Remember, this is the immortality ode, recollections. He's remembering. Plato's doctrine of anamnesis is that we, uh, which informs his notion of teaching, is that we already know the good, the true, the beautiful. Intrinsically, we know it. And teaching is just removing the shadow from someone so that light shines forth. It's not teaching a truth that's out there. The truth is already in here. The goodness is already in here. The beauty is already in here. And the teacher's task is to bring that out of the child through re remembering. And he teaches mathematics this way. It says, actually, the children already know. The adult just needs to let the child remember what he's forgotten. Wordsworth has the same view of human nature. We are this fundamentally good, true, beautiful being, and we've forgotten it. It's worse than just forgetting, though. We walked away from it. That's what he's going to show here. But it's a doctrine of anamnesis. It's a, plat it's a platonic view, and it leads to the idea of reincarnation as well. It's intrinsic. It's a, it's a pagan view. And the, it's a disembodied view. It's a sense of the self embodied. And the, the, the body in this view is effectively like a prison house. And the soul is within it. The soul is good. The body is evil. The body imprisons the soul. And what the aim of religion uh, of the ancient pagan variety is to do is to exalt the, the good of the soul and to distance itself from the evil of the body. This is true of Eastern religion which tends towards nihilism and never mentions God. There's no mention of God in Eastern religions. Um, and it's also true of the paganism of the polytheistic world as well. It tends towards the sense of the soul imprisoned in a body and our bodies in some sense being uh, contrary to the goodness of our souls. So how does Wordsworth conceptualize this? So this is the fifth paragraph fifth stanza. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar, not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God, who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy, Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy. But he beholds the light, and whence it flows. He sees it in his joy. Think of that poem, We Are Seven. The youth who daily farther from the east must travel still is nature's priest, and by the vision splendid is on his way attended. At length, the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day. 
So there are two different types of light. There's the light that reminds us of God and fundamental goodness. We see that very clearly without the shadow of experience when we were young. As we grow older, we walk away from the light. It's not that we are uh, oppressed the way Rousseau presents it. Society comes and gets us and, and conforms us to an image that we don't want to bear. It's that we walk towards it. We want to be like the adults. We want to be big. We want to do what the adults do. Wordsworth's a bit more realistic in this. There's an attraction to experience. Children want to experience things. They don't want to remain without experience. And there's something perverse in this. Why would you want to walk away from the good when it's going to destroy everything that's good in you? In the process, you will lose that vision. But you can see the stages. It starts out, so the heaven is in the infancy. And then the shades of the prison house, the mind-forged manacles, as Blake calls them, begin to close. As the boy grows, they, it shudders more and more and more and more to the point where when he's an adult, there's no light coming in at all. It's gone. This is called becoming an adult. Experientially, when, when you read this, you say that words are on to something here. I'm not untroubled in the world as I once was. When I was young, I had no troubles or cares. Again, if you're an orphan, I think that's not so. I think you have a great deal of troubles and cares. However, relatively speaking, you don't have the cares and anxieties that you do when you're full grown. You've experienced things that will no longer allow you to live in that world. Earth fills her lap with pleasures of her own, yearning she hath in her own natural kind, and even with something of a mother's mind, and no unworthy aim, the homely nurse, this is still a reference to the earth, doth all she can to make her foster child, her inmate, man, forget the glories he hath known, and that imperial palace whence he came. So the earth is now presented as a jailer. Remember, the earth is itself a physical entity and the man at least the real man the inner man is not a physical entity it's a spiritual entity so even the embodied earth it's finite it's limited it is not the good per se what is good is what is unlimited right Heaven is presented as a, a, a place that it's utopian, it doesn't exist, and it can't have a physical manifestation at all because the physical is actually a contradiction of the spiritual good. It's, these are the terms of Gnosticism as well, which you can hear the hints of when you read uh, the letters to the Corinthians and so forth. They're talking about acting as if their bodies didn't matter, as if the rules of nature didn't apply to them. He'll come at it in a different way here. Behold the child among his newborn blisses, a six years darling of a pygmy size. See where mid work of his own hand he lies, fretted by sallies of his mother's kisses. Mom's kissing the six-year-old boy and the boy's going, stop kissing me, I'm big. Stop kissing me like I'm a baby, I'm not a baby. With light upon him from his father's eyes. See at his feet, some little plan or chart, some fragment from his dream of human life, shaped by himself with newly learned art. A wedding or a festival, a mourning or a funeral, and this now hath now his heart. And unto this he frames his song. Then will he fit his tongue to dialogues of business, love or strife as he gets a little older. At first they're just in a, uh, rituals talks about marriage and these sorts of things. Then he moves on to activities, business. But it will not be long ere this be thrown aside, and with new joy and pride the little actor cons another part. He takes on another role. He imitates. He's playing a part. And that's what he does successively. The child starts imitating the adults. 
Aristotle says that the, uh, one of the chief marks of human nature is that we love to imitate. We love imitation. It's one of the features of art. This is why it, we enjoy drama. This is why we like reading because it, we're, we, ca we love the idea of conceptualizing ourselves in another way and the depiction. Imitation, they, he calls it mimesis. It's the, it's the way the arts work. Wordsworth sees this as a problem. Wordsworth, as I say, Aristotle says it's characteristic of human nature and anyone who has a child will know it's true. Kids do what their parents do and they act and they play roles and they take great delight in it. You don't have to tell them to do it. They will do it behind your back. Imitate dad's voice, whatever, even try to do the tone or whatever and everyone else will laugh. Why will they laugh? Because we delight in imitation. It's how teaching works. It, there's a role model you follow. We saw it back in the, the Odyssey, right, with mentor. The, the problem for Odysseus is he had no role model. He didn't know how to act. Mentor comes in, an older man, and says, here's how you behave. And he then does behave that way. He has a role model. He imitates him. He's pleased because up to that point, he had no idea how to act. It was as if he, while well, his father was gone. Education always worked that way through modeling, wisdom and virtue. That's what education is. It's training in wisdom and virtue. Look at the Odyssey. Wordsworth sees this as not uh, only not natural, he sees it as unnatural. It's opposed to our nature to do this. Note how radical this is. He departs not just from the Enlightenment, he departs from all traditional notions of education because he says this, filling from time to time his humorous stage with all the persons down to palsied age where he's old and can't stand upright, that life brings with her in her equipage as if his whole vocation were endless imitation. As if he were to just to be an adult, to be like the adults, to be big, to imitate. If I want to press even more strongly what I've just said already, uh, the Christian faith calls us to imitate Christ. He's the model of humanity that we're to follow. We're not to invent our own humanity, walk, chart a different path. That's called, that's called parting from the straight and narrow path. That's called being lost in sin. You're to imitate him. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So there's a pattern of imitation which goes with Christian education. You're supposed to be a role model, not according to Wordsworth. There's a higher vocation than that. Thou, whose exterior semblance, whose outside, whose body, whose appearance, everything he does, doth belie thy soul's immensity. Thou best philosopher, who yet dost keep thy heritage. Thou eye among the blind, that deaf and silent reads the eternal deep, haunted forever by the, the eternal mind. Mighty prophet, seer, blessed, on whom those truths do rest which we are toiling all our lives to find. In darkness lost, the darkness of the grave, thou over whom thy immortality broods like the day, a master or a slave, a presence which is not to be put by, to whom the grave is but a lonely bed without the sense or sight of day or the warm light, a place of thought where we in waiting lie, Thou little child, yet glorious in the might of heaven-born freedom on thy being's height. Why, with such earnest pains, dost thou provoke the years to bring the inevitable yoke, the yoke of slavery? Thus blindly with thy blessedness at strife, full soon thy soul shall have her earthly freight and custom lie upon thee with a weight heavy as frost and deep almost as life. The good is already within you. Why are you walking away from the good? Why do you want to go in that direction? 
Why do you want to imitate? Why do you want to become worldly? This is Christian language. Does he have a, a Christian meaning with, to the Christian language? And the answer is absolutely not. He is, he's uh, proposing uh, the immortality of the soul, which is a heresy, heretical doctrine. We are embodied souls. That's what human nature is, of a rational nature. Let me not interrupt, because it's not wholly gone. It's not wholly gone, the goodness, because he's already identified it. He can see it. Where was it in the past? Then how can we get that back? Oh, joy, that in our embers is something that doth live, that nature yet remembers what was so fugitive. The thought of our past years in me doth breed perpetual benediction. Not indeed for that which is most worthy to be blessed, delight and liberty, the simple creed of childhood, whether busy or at rest, with new-fledged hope still fluttering in his breast. So not for lost innocence. That's not what he praises. Because otherwise he would just want to become like a child again, which he knows is impossible. It's not for that. Remember he talked about that in Tintern Abbey as well. He talked about how... Five years ago, when he was young and he walked, he, he went through nature, he was not really seeing it from the perspective of experience. It was just all around him and he felt it and there was no reflection that went at, into it at all. It was just delight without thought. But now he thinks and he can't experience the world just that way. He has to think and reflect. Not for these, that is the old good experiences, I raise the songs of thanks and praise, but for those obstinate questionings of sense and outward things. Questioning the outward things. Fallings from us, vanishings, blank misgivings of a creature moving about in worlds not realized high instincts before which our mortal nature did tremble like a guilty thing surprised. But for those first affections, those shadowy recollections, which be they what they may, are yet the fountain light of our day, are yet a master light of all our seeing, uphold us, cherish, and have power to make our noisy years see moments in the being of the eternal silence. Truths that wake to perish never, which neither listlessness nor mad endeavor nor man nor boy nor all that is enmity with, at enmity with joy can utterly abolish or destroy. Hence, in a season of calm weather, though inland far we be, our souls have sight of that immortal sea which brought us hither can in a moment travel thither and see the children sport upon the shore and hear the mighty waters rolling evermore. In other words, through the imagination of our childhood, we can recollect that and the imagination holds on to it. So the imagination, which I said is the watchword of the whole romantic movement, is appealed to above all things, is the means by which we can bring about a spiritual transformation of life. Imagine all the people living life in peace. John Lennon, you, you probably don't even know what I'm talking about. John Lennon, imagine, okay, anyway. This is a romantic vision. Through the imagination, just think about that. And he says, there's, imagine there's no heaven. Easy if you can. No sky above us. It's just sky. No heaven above us. Just, just sky. Not a place. And there's an inclusiveness. It's, it's panentheism there. It's, he's, he's channeling Wordsworth there. Very much of the culture of our day. 
let's dream about and imagine the good things. We'll hold on to them and that imaginative vision we will pass on to the children and let the children lead us how they want to lead themselves. And that's the future because the goodness lies within the children. Let's, let's support whatever they come up with themselves because it comes from a goodness, a place of goodness. And to deny that is, is ipso facto evil then. So if you deny that, that what the child is saying is good and valid, then you are going against the tenets of the new religion. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but there you go. Then sing ye birds, sing, sing a joyous song and let the young lambs bound as to the tabor sound. A tabor is a type of drum. We in thought will join your throng, ye that pipe and ye that play, ye that through your hearts today feel the gladness of the May. What though the radiance which was once so bright be now forever taken from my sight, though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind, in the primal sympathy which having been must ever be, in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering, in the faith that looks through death in years that bring the philosophic mind. He speaks of a faith. What's the faith in? It's in what he calls the philosophic mind. What is the philosophic mind? The panentheist mind. I have faith in the power of my mind to create an imaginative reality which you too will embrace and this will change the world, not physically, but within us. Almost echoing Milton and what is said to Adam and Eve, they'll have a paradise within, happy or far. And a utopian society will want to make that imaginative reality, that sense of human nature, which we make up or children make up into the world in which we live. And we'll want to get rid of the traditions of past generations or even the idea of human personhood. We need to move beyond that. And O oh, ye fountains, meadows, hills and groves, forebode not any severing of our loves. Yet in my heart of hearts I feel your might. I only have relinquished one delight, to live beneath your more habitual sway. I love the brooks which down their channels fret, even more than when I tripped lightly as they. The innocent brightness of a new day, newborn day, is lovely yet. The clouds that gather around the setting sun do take a sober coloring from an eye that hath kept watch o'er man's mortality. Another race hath been, and other palms are one. Thanks to the human heart by which we live, thanks to its tenderness, its joys, and fears. To me, the meanest flower <clears throat> that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. It ends with a little tinge of sadness. Interesting. You, you would expect it to conclude with a note of triumph and exultation. He doesn't do that. I think it's what actually adds something to the poem. But no, the worst thing you could imagine, are there, are, is there a place that are thoughts that are too deep to be even expressed? So the thoughts need to be brought forth. The world of the mind. This is very much of a spiritual movement, is very much of an intellectual movement. Comments or questions? I'd like to discuss this now a little bit, if I can, if we can. Yes. That's Rousseau's view. Wordsworth's view is I corrupt myself. He's saying it's in, and 
And so there's a logical problem with this. If the child's so good, then why on earth does the child become not good? And not because the child's been deceived, the child is walking towards not goodness. How come? That's his question. Why do you do this? He has no answer to the question. That's because it makes no sense. Right? It doesn't make any sense. You can't explain why a being who's fundamentally good should desire to be not that. So, as I say, Rousseau presents it as, they made me do this. They made me this way. It's their fault. It's society's fault. Wordsworth is a, it comes at it a little differently and says, yes, I be, I, but I actually I desire that. And so he has a bigger problem in a sense. I think Rousseau has the same problem. If all the people that are in society were fundamentally good, <laughs> then how did they become this place where they're all evil, gathered together, other than just with the, by gathering together with other people. And so solitude is the way you avoid that. You just avoid other people and you become a sociopath. Be a, be a hermit. I mean, Wordsworth leans that way as well. Let me be in the, in the forest by myself and I'll avoid the uh, corruption that comes from being around other people. Which again speaks to some truth because other people do Bad company corrupts good character. There's, there's truth in that. However, it's not a fundamental truth. You can't avoid the problem of your sinful nature by avoiding other people. Because your thoughts are there and your, your heart's corrupted. Being away from other people is not going to solve that problem. Anyway, y yes, uh, I, I do think there's that. Do you see what I see? Uh, what I said about this being the beginning of the study of psychology, in the sense that modern psychology, it's got all, it's got a hundred different manifestations, different schools. This is one of my criticisms of psychology as a science. It, like, if you're going to call yourself a science, then there has to be a sort of a uh, normative perspective on what the stud the subject is that you're studying, and. In this case, what, is, what do we mean by the psyche? The ology means a science or, or a, a field of study, right? So the ology, we've got that. But the psyche, what is the psyche? What do you study in psychology? For some, it's what Wordsworth's talking about. It's the mental aspect. It's our mental health. We even call it in relation to psychology. We talk about mental health. And when we do that, we mean something disembodied. Right, the way I'm thinking, the way I'm feeling about my thoughts. That, that's what we mean by psychology. But there's a strong emphasis in our day in connecting the mind to the body and seeing psychology as the study of the brain and brain chemistry. And therefore you take medication to deal with the problem of your, your thinking. And they're pushing it very hard that way. They're so deterministic, in fact, that they think that the that Chemistry is the, the solution to every mental health problem. Um, which one of them is right? Is it, the, is it a disembodied mind or is it a physical brain? And how does the brain, the gray matter here, how does the brain relate to the mind? And how does the mind, which we associate with thinking, and with conceptualizing like Wordsworth has just done, to imagine that you're in a different situation, which we're able to do, and to appeal to uh, and understand arithmetic. A number, by the way, is not a physical entity at all. It's a, it's a symbol, very mathematical. The universe works that way. How are we able to reason with a brain if it's just brain chemistry? How is that possible? How can you follow the laws of our logic? How can you follow an argument? You can't see my words. You can hear them. Can you understand them? Yes. How do you understand them? How do they make sense? There's a logical ordering. You can follow a train of argument. Again, that's not a physical thing. That's a spiritual thing, for lack of a better word. So how do we give account for those two different things that hold together? That's the problem of psychology as a discipline. 
what's the view of human nature? There's the, there's the key issue right there. What is the view of human nature? And I've just said that Wordsworth's view of human nature is impersonal. It's not personal. But human nature in Christian theology is personal because God is personal and we bear his image. Right? The tri-personal God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? And we bear his image. So it must mean to be a person. Wordsworth says no. Yes? I think they're connected. Um, the, uh, the dualists of the pagan world uh, want to see them at war with one another and really utterly distinct. Um, the standard uh, pagan view is that we have three components to us. We have, we have a, a mind, we have a body, and we have a spirit appetites we have we they call them appetites or the traditional language of appetites come the 19th century they get rebranded and they're called emotions new word emotions are something we push out rather than passions something we suffer passions are passive emotions are are active this is the romantic movement exercising its influence on language by the way the passions are, we, it's a felt response. The, the task of the educator, uh, as Plato presents it in uh, his allegory of the chariot, is to let reason, which is like the charioteer, ride the horses of our human nature, which are connected to our passions. You're to take your, your passions, which are directed towards the good, and make sure they're directed towards the good and not the evil. But you need to do that by thinking rightly. You order your feelings. Make sure that they stay in their place. It's not that they're not relevant, they are entirely relevant, but they need to be directed towards what's virtuous and good and true and beautiful and not towards what is scandalous and shameful. What we call evil. The Greeks understood the, the Greek Greeks are not monotheists, but they still have a notion of good and evil and virtues and vices. The pantheists get rid of all that. Answer to your question, I don't know. Yes, somewhat answering. Um. But Plato, Plato wants to take it away from the Greeks, even though he's a Greek. He, he seems to point towards an idealization which seems more uh, to almost anticipate what becomes Gnosticism. The mind over the body, the body being evil, uh, I don't think he ever fully gets there, but um, it, it leans that way. Sorry, I interrupted no, you. No worries. It, it, does, it does do a bit more clarity. Like what you said, what was the passion and emotion kind of difference of passion to the mind and what you're pushing out? Well, think about the passion of the Christ, right? It's the suffering. What does Jesus do at the cross, the passion of the Christ? He suffers, like physically suffers, but literally the action. They nail him to the cross. Does he put himself up there? No, he is put up there. He becomes a passive agent of their action. And the irony there at the cross is that where God is utterly suffering at the hands of his enemies, that's where he's doing the greatest work that was ever done. Because he bears our sins by suffering. There's the action of God right there. Because he, when he dies, sin dies with him. And then when he rises, right? So this passion, this passive act is the most powerful act ever done. Real, anyway. Yeah. Um, where I was coming from with the question, though. Yes. For a little bit more clarity, I was, it's just maybe this is a better question for someone in more of a psychological um, area. But I, I would be interested to hear your perspective on like in psychology and what you learn about is like emotions are triggered by hormones and whatnot in your body, so it's a very much more physical thing. Yet from just kind of growing up and living life, it's easy to more assume emotions and passion come from mind aspect, right? A non-physical aspect. Yet psychology as a science does actually prove a bit of a more physical aspect to it. So, I don't know, like as Christians, it's like, sometimes it's hard to find, okay, what's going on there, what's kind of happening. So, this is really a great observation, and psychology does talk about the influence of hormones. 
and so, hence hormone therapy uh, of various sorts, like in certain instances, or chemicals. You'll take a drug for this that will rectify an imbalance here or whatever. Um, what psychology is acknowledging now, which it didn't at one point, was that being, having a body is connected to our thinking. Like our physical well-being is connected to our mental health. And so the Christian view of human nature that uh, God didn't, it wasn't the mind of God that uh, God took on human flesh. So we look at, so the, the question or the way you get out of the challenge is and conflicting points of view, the idea, oh no, we're just mental, we're just intellectual, Wordsworth seems to suggest that. Or the modern psychologist, well, we're just brains. And, and bodies and and what we call thinking is what a philosopher will call epiphenomenology which is that we think that we're thinking but actually we're just feeling the results of hormones it's the appearance of thinking but it's not really thinking it's just I think I'm happy right now that's just the endorphins in my brain I can make you happy sure take a happy pill now you're happy so there's a reduction. So then again, when you push too hard on that, it, it discounts that thinking is actually even thinking. It's just feeling. You can get a little soma. We're going to come to Brave New World, uh, where, where they talk about, you know, you're given a happy pill to make you feel good about yourself. So it's a reductionist view of human nature, reduces you to a body. The view of Wordsworth reduces you to a mind. The Christian view of human nature is that you are both. We're to ha persons have minds. We're to have the mind of Christ. He's a person. We're to have the mind of Christ, which is in you, right? We're to think God's thoughts after him. But to be a Christian then, oh, well, let's just look at this rather than me going on. Let's look at Romans 12. I to appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. How about that? It, how, present your bodies, which is your spiritual worship? How is that so? And then goes on, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, which is what is good and acceptable and perfect. So it, it's both. Your body, which you're presenting, is a part of your spiritual worship. Don't divorce what you do with your body with spiritual goodness. It is intrinsic to it. Did Jesus not take on a human body? Did he not obey bodily? Did, was he not tempted bodily? Time in the wilderness, didn't eat for 40 days, and then temptation, is, are those not bodily temptations? Yes. So your, what you do with your body matters a great deal. This is the issue in the Corinthian church. They, some of them are stopping, these are married couples, they stop having sexual relations because they, they live, they're, living, they're being more spiritual. There are others with the same mindset, by the way, who are having sexual relations with people that are incestual. Somebody's sleeping with his mother-in-law again calls himself a Christian. What the heck? Like in both cases, what's going on? They think of themselves spiritual and not embodied. What they do with the body doesn't matter because the body isn't themselves. They have a spiritual reality. They can do whatever they want. You have to have a right view of human nature. You have to understand that your body and your mind are both dedicated to the Lord and the whole is there. And that's here in Romans 12. A living sacrifice, yes, it's bodied, embodied, but yes, your spiritual worship will involve intellectual transformation. The, the mind rules the body. Don't let your bodies rule your mind. You, it's, so there is, a, there is a hierarchy here. It's not that the body doesn't matter. It does matter, but it's ruled by your mind. And you are no longer to be conformed to, the, to this world. What is the, this world, or some translation, the pattern of this world? That's panentheism. That's the pattern of this world right now but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, how are we gonna test? By scripture. You may discern what is good, the will of God. The will of God is revealed in his word. That's how you're gonna test it. 
what is good and acceptable and perfect. You had a question or a comment? Sorry, I didn't get to it. Please do. In psychology, or you're saying there hasn't been? But that's because they dispute that reason is intrinsic to human nature. They don't think that reason is. They think that rationality is, is, a, is a white man's imposition. It, it, that's not, rationality is not true of human nature. That's just a European myth of oppression. There is no category of, of reasoning and logic that holds true for everyone. So there's, there's you know, that's, that's a white math, that's not black math. I mean, really, two plus two equals four is white? Like what? How, what a bizarre thought. But that reason is being disputed at this, at this time as being true for everyone, irrespective of what they look like or where they come from. That's actually, so they're disputing, in other words, that human nature is rational. And, they, and what is the pro, what's the outcome of that? Well, <laughs> those that are in the brain camp of psychology, they're going to sell you drugs. They can make money off of it. And it might make you feel better. It might make you feel worse. And if it makes you feel worse, here's another pill. <laughs> Let me try that one. And I'll, or we'll just do a little blend. How does that work for you? Oh, that's, yeah, okay, you got that right. Did it solve your problems? Nope. Not quite, but yeah, comment or question? Yeah. So if you go to church and you don't do what God wants you to do, you are not a righteous. So Very good. Righteous. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Uh, the, the root commandment of Scripture is be, be holy, even as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19.2. It's, it's mentioned in the New Testament repeatedly. To be holy. So to be set apart, to be righteous, but that means to be like God. Now, you can't do that on your own, but God makes you righteous. His imputed righteousness, well, you need to walk in that righteousness, and it's not, you can do whatever you want and get rid of the categories of good and evil. You have to cling to the good. Whatever is good, true, beautiful, lovely, whatever these things do. Well, that's, right, that's righteousness, right? But it's not our standard of righteousness. It's not a universal. It's, it's specifically a God defined notion of good and evil. Again, the spirit, uh, the church has been overcome by pan pantheism and the idea of good and evil being human categories and reasoning being a, an imposition of Western civilization and not true of the nature of reality. Anyway, I think we're coming to a conclusion. Does anyone want to say anything more? Question, observation, or should I just leave it off of that? Okay, I'll leave it with that. Uh, but